Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. So, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, today's security sig, uh, the third one. Uh, the agenda is, is the same as reflected on the GitHub repo. Um, so, some introductions and then trivia. Um, we had an interesting Kobe summit this past week, so I wanted to catch everyone up on that. Uh, wanted to also continue the discussion from last time we had about build chain security and talk about signing. Uh, and then uh, our, we have a treat today. We have Mikael, who is the maintainer of Landlock LSM, which is a new Linux security module that leverages eBPF, so extended packet filters to allow for some very interesting, unprivileged sandboxing qualities. Um, and then if we have time at the end, uh, we can broadly discuss any updates on the security projects or other topics, want to have an open floor, uh, and then preview the next meeting, which we're tentatively scheduling for July 5th. Um, and at any time, if there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt me uh, or chime in. Uh, so I guess we'll get started. So firstly, if there's anyone new on the line that uh, wants to say hello, uh, we'd love to, to meet you. Um, looking at the, the attendee list, it looks like we have a lot of folks, I don't know if it rotates that way, but yeah. A lot of folks, uh, repeaters from previous time, but if there's anyone I'm maybe not scrolling to see, please feel free to, to chime in. But I think we're, I think, it's, I think we've all, we've all said hello before. So welcome back everyone. Uh, as for other administrative, yeah, I uh, mentioned that next meeting is tentatively scheduled for July 5th. Uh, again, I'll be posting on the forum. I'm new Americans on holiday. I'm <laughs> We have the fourth off, and the Monday is kind of this awkward, like the Monday's the third in between the fourth and the weekend. So if folks, if the fifth isn't good for folks, just let me know, and we can maybe reschedule this week. I know that we have a fairly international SIG, so don't know how much of a problem this is. But let me know if uh, you can't make it or, and you'd like to come. We're still figuring out the agenda uh, as well. So you have ideas for the agenda or things you'd like to discuss, present. Uh, we are all ears and would love to, to get that penciled in. And of course, this is on the GitHub repo and on the forum, I'll be posting all the, all the information. Okay. Uh, as for other ministry, I mentioned that we had a Moby Summit this past Monday. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the event, uh, the Moby project is an encompassing project for a lot of other uh, open source projects that we've started here at Docker, such as Containerd, uh, Moby, RunC, Notary, SwarmKit, uh, and LinuxKit. So we had some, uh, a couple of updates for, from Justin and Rolf about the state of LinuxKit, uh, and I gave a, a brief update on uh, the security side as well as the stake, which folks are very excited about. Uh, and both of those presentations were recorded and will be posted soon, as, as I understand it. Yeah. Uh, and the slides themselves are on the community Slack. Please ping if you can't find them, and uh, I can link you to them. They're also going to be posted somewhere as well okay. with the tools. Okay, good. So, so the, the slides and the talks we posted together. Uh, as for the Linux kit side, we had some birds of a feather uh, discussions in, in the afternoon. And Justin, feel free to chime in if there's stuff that I'm missing. But I think the high level uh, discussion points and requests were more platforms that folks want to use VirtualBox. And there was a lot of bare metal interest for Linux yes. kit. Uh, auditing as well, since we don't have Audit D and we've been uh, looking at Falco. But generally, today we don't have an auditing solution in Linux kit. And that was a uh, request that we got. Uh, from a few folks. Uh, and generally, I think, and Justin, feel free to chime in, but I think there's a lot of interest in uh, the security project. So exciting for us. Uh, I think folks both not, not knowing what certain things were, but also wanting to learn a lot more about individual projects. So um, I don't think the, the box, we had a recap session where uh, Justin went through all of the kind of high level points and some details. I don't, I think that was recorded and will be yeah, posted. I think so. And the summary um, also will be posted. Okay, so both summary and the video for the recap of those box will be posted um, soon. We're just waiting on uh, that team. So um, if, there are, yeah, if there are any questions about the summit in general, 
Uh, I think it was, it was a good event. I think we're planning for one, uh, another one in uh, the Open Source Summit in LA, the, what used to be known as LinuxCon. Uh, so if you're around for that event in September, uh, we'll probably be in touch. Um, and then I think there'll be another one in October at DockerCon EU. At DockerCon EU in Copenhagen. So hope to see everyone at, at one or both of those um, if possible. Cool. So any administrative questions, comments, concerns? I think our next topic um, is digging into package signing. So I didn't want I don't want to dive in just yet unless there everyone is Okay, uh, I guess we'll, we'll dive right into it. Uh, last time, uh, Lorenzo brought up some good discussion points around build chain security, uh, in particular, position independent executables and ASLR. And one part we didn't get to uh, that we kind of talked about at the summit and was interesting for folks, and I wanted to kind of bring some of that discussion back here and get some feedback uh, is how we do package signing. Um, and so as many of you know, we rely heavily on Docker images for uh, packaging our kernel, init, any packages. And what we've been doing in order to, to anchor trust in this image is we've been signing them um, using Docker signing mechanism. So I wanted to dig in, into a little bit about what that actually means. So today, all of the Linux kit slash images are signed, um, and they're signed with Docker content trust, uh, which is when you're sign, you're pushing with Docker, you just export one environment variable, Docker content trust equals one, uh, and then it will kick off a push and sign as opposed to just a push to, to the registry. Uh, Docker content trust itself is in a very opinionated and uh, much simpler to use version uh, of basically wrapping notary, which is, uh, the library that has all the signing and verification mechanisms and all of the crypto pieces uh, to facilitate that. Um, and so to give some more information about Notary, um, it's signing and verification framework and it's, it's key guarantees are uh, authenticity, uh, so that you know, you can understand who signed um, the image, uh, integrity to understand that the image bits haven't been tampered with. Um, and as you know, this, these are both fairly standard uh, signature properties that you may get with GPG or other signing mechanisms. But where Notary adds more is, is that you have both freshness guarantees where packages are given an expiration date and uh, hard versioning so that you can't get rolled back to an old version, nor can you install an out of, out of date package. Uh, and it also provides survivable key compromise uh, guarantees. And so what this means is that if one of the Linux kit maintainers accidentally loses a key, it's very simple uh, with Notary, there's a very structured and simple mechanism to rotate out their key and rotate in a new key without having to distribute a, like a revocation list or completely break the trust chain of previous packages. Um, and to dig into how Notary does this, uh, is that Notary at its core is about signing metadata to, co to capture context about a package. So not just signing the package itself or signing just, just only a hash, but also additional metadata like when it should expire so we have freshness guarantees, uh, how many people should sign it for the, the package to be valid. So we have uh, an idea of thresholding here. So multiple signers have to sign off for a package to be considered even valid in, in the Notary repo. And also which keys are allowed to be used. You have a white list of keys that are allowed to sign for a package. And this is how we rotate keys. We update that white list. Um, and all of this is a very storied history because it's actually based on a research project out of NYU uh, known as the update framework, which is there are several academic peer reviewed papers uh, about issues they found in current package manager signing systems, such as lack of freshness and making it very, very difficult to rotate, for example, GPG keys. Uh, and then they proposed a new framework that, that they dubbed the update framework, um, which is basically the baseline uh, specification that Notary implements. It's also interesting because 
that the framework actually has roots in Tor's updater project. So the Tor project uh, is software for anonymity over the, over the internet and has uh, a very strong attacker model because nation states uh, maybe uh, certain nation states try to block it or tamper with it. And so their update, their update system, Fandy, uh, had very strong attacker models and security guarantees that the update framework leveraged uh, when it created its specification. So that's at its core uh, what Notary is, and that again, that Docker Content Trust uh, basically wraps Notary in, in the Docker CLI in an opinionated way so that we can sign packages when we push Docker images to the registry. And again, please feel free to interrupt me if anything uh, needs more. If you have any questions or if anything's unclear or if you have any comparison points. Um, otherwise, I'll just kind of, a few more slides, which we'll kind of keep on going uh, with this. So um, today, the way that you, you see how this is validated or how we kind of, you see the, the signing bubble up uh, in Linux Kit is that in your YAML files that you specify a, a Linux Kit OS that you'd like to build, uh, there's this trust section. Uh, I think we put it at the bottom of all of our examples um, that basically tells the Mobi builder, I want to verify all of the images in this organization, so the Linux Kit organization, uh, and you can additionally specify that you want to, on a per image level, uh, verify signatures for those images. And so the Mobi Builder will actually first check the notary metadata for the image, uh, verify the signatures, verify that it isn't expired before pulling it down, uh, and again, verifying that the hash it pulls down matches the hash that was signed in. Uh, so if the signature verification fails, uh, it, it fails at build time. Uh, so you can't actually build a Linux kit based OS uh, on a signature failure. Uh, and so that's like the verification side. On the signing side, uh, one thing that we're, we're doing today is that we're using multiple roles for different signers. So uh, currently we have the maintainers. So Ian, Justin, Rolf, myself, assigned to individual keys, which in this case are are a delegation, so they're scoped to a, a finer scope and have less privilege. Um, and you can kind of see that, I lost my mouse, but you have this target slash Ian, target slash Justin, Riaz, Rolf. We also have a, a couple of additional roles, uh, which are for intended for CI, as we're trying to figure out CI to get CI signing, as well as this releases role that basically is the canonical role for saying, hey, I want to release a package, I should sign into this role. And so you'll notice that uh, all the maintainers, so Ian, Justin, Rolf, myself, our keys are both in our own roles, but then also in the releases role. Um, and so what this allows us to do is audit against our own roles. So in this case, I'm able to audit everything that Rolf has signed for the kernel. So you can see that if I do a list of all the things that are signed for kernel and specify that I want to look at Rolf's delegation, I get all of the, 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 the kernel that he signed. Uh, but I could do the same for myself or Justin as well as all the released roles. So this is today, if you were to use Notary, you can, you can kind of poke around and, and take a look at what everything we've signed and how we've signed it, um, and what kind of, um, you can basically audit who, who assigned what. And then I think in the future, one thing that I, we want to move toward is having a policy around this. So saying on a, for example, on a Linux kit release, we would like the kernel to be signed off by two maintainers and CI that only signs on a successful test run. So that, these, these different roles uh, allow us to reason about that and invent policies that uh, let us do this for a better and more trusted release process. So um, I wanted to open up for just some brainstorming. I've discussed with uh, the Linux Tech maintainers, especially Justin and Rolf, around some future direction that we want to go for this. And I wanted to get some idea, just kind of a feeling here if there's something that we're missing or something that you, you think we should look into. Um, I think the most immediate uh, step forward for us will be key pinning. Uh, so saying that for our first download especially, uh, all Linux kit images, the root key must either 
validate up to a, a CA that we control as Linux Git maintainers or uh, whitelist the exact root key that we use to sign and initialize the repo. Uh, and that would probably show up as an extra uh, option in the YAML file. And here's justification for the trust section. I kind of alluded to this earlier around the delegation roles, but especially for releases, we'd like to enforce multi-signature thresholds uh, that multiple maintainers and CI systems have signed off on a release before it's considered valid. Another idea that we've had is to actively remove, or I put it in quotes because we can just let the signatures expire um, so that they're no longer valid since you have freshness guarantees, uh, to basically invalidate old packages. So for example, really old kernel versions that we signed at one point, but probably don't want people to pull down again. So like a four, you know, 491 kernel, for example, or you know, four, four something, four, three something. What's the default expiry? Yes, so the default expiry is, so it, it's a little, there are multiple roles. I think for the roles that we're signing with, it's quite a while, it's a, couple, it's a year or two. Okay. We can expose in the, the client library or in the CLI for notary, uh, or even in Docker or config to bring that down to a, a, a lower amount. Um, but again, I'm not, not sure how much time we want yeah. to support releases for. So if any folks have ideas of how long you think the signature should be, should be valid for, that'd be, that'd be interesting, I guess. We're concurrently thinking about like releases of Linux kits and we have yet to do one. So we haven't been really, uh, you know, had experience around what works, especially since we have all these hub images as well as a tool that are kind of marching together in lockstep. So if anyone has ideas or features they'd like to see, um, we'd love to hear them. So let's just open up the floor and um, just kind of get a, if there's any, any questions, feedback, discussion. Well, feel free to discuss in Slack or forum or... Yeah, yeah. that too. So if, if uh, the Linux kit community channel or the forum, if you think of questions later or have other concerns, uh, be more than happy to discuss there. So maybe we table for now uh, this. Um, I want to make sure we have a lot of time for NKL, which we are right on schedule, so it's perfect. Uh, so with that, I'd like to move on to the next item in our agenda, uh, which is we're... Uh, extremely lucky to have Mikael uh, on joining us today, who is the maintainer of Landlock LSM. Um, so, Mikael, if you're there, I'm going to turn off my sharing. Yeah. And hopefully, that gets. Yeah, I'm going to share my. Um, okay, let me share this. Okay. okay. Is it okay? Yep. Great. Okay, so, so hi everyone. So I'm Miguel Salin. Um, I'm happy to give this talk. So thanks uh, for the Linux Kit team to invite me. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Landlock. Um, so it's a problematic access console. So I'm gonna explain what it means and why you need it, what why you may need it, and how to use it. And then you'll see like a bit how to how it works. So first, uh, what is the goal here? So most of the time, when you want to secure software, well, uh, an attacker may be interested by com com compromising a process. So this process may um, may be in a container environment, a desktop environment, and so on. So it's the first step to compromise the process uh, thanks to a bug, like for example in a parser. And then the attacker may want to escalate to gain more privileges. So here I just uh, give an example with a uh, um, um, uh, vulnerability. And then the final goal is to access uh, data from the user. So that's uh, that's you. 
But what can we do is to protect uh, against this threat. So, well, the first uh, thing to do is to try to secure, um, to develop a secure software with um, um, languages which can give your uh, security properties. Um, the second point is to try to follow the least privileged principle. And the third point is try to compartmentalize um, exposed processes. So these are complementary um, uh, things to do. But today I'm going to talk about the two last points, and mainly compartmentalization uh, well, to create access control. So today we have um, multiple ways to apply an access control in Linux. So for example, AC Linux, Apparmos, Mac, Automodio are um, common uh, LSM which can be used to restrict um, access control, well, to restrict accesses um, on a system. So it is designed to be used by an administrator, um, commonly the roots of the system. So it can allow to uh, put in place a fine grade access control. Access control, for example, access to uh, files, uh, uh, inodes, uh, file descriptor and so on. Um, so it is not designed to be used by unpublished uh, processes, and it is not designed. They are not designed to be used what, to to help applications to embed it to embed in uh, so to to as a developer to embed it um, security policy in application in a standalone way. I think um, it's not possible. Uh, it is designed to help the administrator to secure its system, but to help the developer to make a more robust application. And by application, I mean uh, it can be a container too. So there's also other mechanisms which can be used to secure um, our processes. Uh, so second DPF and spaces are not designed to be used as an access control mechanism but they can help to restrict the process. Um, An important point here is they're not designed to uh, give you fine-grained access control. For example, with SecComp, uh, which is kind of a framework for syscalls. You can filter syscall uh, number and some kind, well, the, the raw value of syscall arguments, but you cannot filter, for example, a path uh, which may be found by the open Cisco. And but the interesting thing is you can embed it a security policy, a system security policy, in an application in a standard way. Uh, so it is independent from um, the system security policy. And it's a bit similar for namespaces. So namespaces are is way to restrict the view of a process. Uh, for example, um, the view of the file, uh, the, file the network, on, or IPC. But they are not designed to, well, for example, to um, filter file descriptors, use, for example. But in some way, they can be used in an privileged way, uh, thanks to the user namespaces. Um, but uh, this may bring some new issues too, uh, because it is very complex and can imply, well, security issues. So all these mechanisms are used by different applications uh, like uh, system services, uh, user application like uh, web browser, uh, sandbox manager, which by the way are um, almost all run uh, with the SUID uh, flag. So most of the time they are run as root, and then uh, they drop the privileges. And of course, the container manager, like Docker or Leaky. So all of these kind of applications use or may use this uh, security mechanism. So landlock here is to try to um, enter these three programs. So when control and privilege way to uh, enforce a control and to embed a security policy in an application in a standard way. So this 
three um, properties are kind of answer, and these are the principle uh, which I'm interesting to. So the interesting thing is it doesn't force you to choose a specific access control model. You're free to uh, write your own access model, which fits the best for you, your use case. An important point also is it's Monoc is a stackable LSM, which means it's, it is not uh, there to replace HTN access control system like uh, SNX, but it is there to tighten access control to add more restrictions to an end to stack. And so Linux use um, system of rules and you can stack rules the same way you can stack filter for six from VPS. So one process can add one rule and apply the rule to itself and then apply more rules to it after. There's no global system view, which means it is kind of uh, main space agnostic. It is important here to be able to enforce a security policy. Uh, whatever the process to enforcing this policy to uh, use namespaces. So whether it, it use namespaces or not, the security policy will be enforced the same way. And last but not least, um, not is designed to be used without uh, this ready flag, you know, complex buffers, which are uh, always found in sandbox um, applications. So here, um, different kind of application and developers may be interested with this kind of features. Uh, of course, applications with are secure aware. Uh, if you want to develop a secure application and you want this application to some like it does, like it is, um, it is becoming common with uh, web browser today. Um, for some like managers too, um, because it has them it helps this application to what um, well, backs in more uh, uh, well in a different way in a dynamic way. I will see. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And of course, uh, container managers. Um, the idea here is to create well to add a container. So let's see how we can use um, a Luna group. First, the developer uh, needs to create, to write his, uh, his the, the rule, which is uh, written in a subset of the C. And then, thanks to the client compiler, um, uh, part of LVM, uh, you can get an UBF bytecode. So it's compiled, built to get an UBF bytecode. I talk about EBBF more deeply in a uh, following uh, slide. Then, when you have your rule in EBBF, well, you can embed this uh, this rule in an application. And when an, this application is run, the resulting res process uh, can then load the rule uh, in the code. So now, when the 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 rule is loaded in the file. The rule is applied to the this process and all its future children. So it's the same way uh, as it is used in second BBS. So let's take a look at um, another rule. So here I'm gonna show you another rule which is really simple. So the goal here is to create a readme environment. Um, but if you want to use a readme environment which is usable, you want uh, your computations, but well, you want to get with the result of your computation. So in some way, the process, the sandbox process, needs to write. So here, the goal is very simple. It's allow the process to write on and so this rule uh, will be executed each time process, the sandbox process, try to access a system like um, resource object. So here it is. 
the important point here, so to start, so it, it's, um, it's really a, like a common uh, T function. The important, here, the important point is the, the function argument here is a strict lunar context, which is named CTX. So I'll explain later what it contains exactly, but uh, we'll see there what you can do with it. So the important thing in this rule is at the line seven, the rule look at which action is asked by the sandbox process. If this action is not the right action, then the rule allow this action. So you can read, you can execute, and so on. However, if it is a right action, then thanks to the thermal argument from the context, which is a file handle, you can call the dedicated functions, which is called BPF and LFS get mode, to get the mode of the file. So here you are able to compare this mode and look why is a is pipe on it. If the file is a pipe, then it is a load. Otherwise, they will deny uh, any access of the access. So now let's see what this context contains. So it is it's not the, the last uh, like the last version I sent uh, the last time. Uh, it is kind of a new one, uh, a simpler one. So I'm going to explain the main parts. The status is mainly a bit field, which is not used actually. It will be used in the, in the future. I, I will talk about the cookie later, but an important, important point here is the event field. So the event field here uh, contains a value, uh, which is for the rule an event FS uh, ID. So this allows you to identify for which kind of action of um, action of a specific uh, kernel object the rule will be run on. The second argument like we saw uh, uh, in the example contain kind of an ID, this kind of a file handler which is not usable as is, but can be passed to um, the dedicated BP function. And the second argument, so here R2, is um, uh, can contain for this, um, uh, for, for an event FS event, can contain uh, multiple actions like execution, write, read, new when a new file is created, get when you open a file, remove when the file is uh, removed, and some specific action like IUCTL, lock, and SCNTL, which are uh, kind of uh, dedicated syscopes. So thanks to this, you're able to see which action is performed on a specific kernel object, on a specific file. But you may want to get more information about this action. For example, for an IOCTL or lock or an FECTL action, you may, you may want to know which command uh, is asked by the process. So for this, the idea here is to have like sub-events, which are called after the generic FS event. So here you can see why there is a field called R1 and R2, which are kind of generic. They are generic because they can be used by different events. And the semantic of this field is tied to the event. So for example, the R1 field um, for the event FSIUCTL will still contain a file handle, but the R2 field for so the FSIUCTL event will not contain uh, an action like fsexec, but will, will contain 
and then you see GL comment, which allow you to chain rules and um, tighten your access control depending on a specific action. So here you may want you may have an idea why the cookie may be interesting. The cookie is um, an, a unique ID which is used uh, for events uh, which are called uh, one after the other in the same action. For example, here um, the event FS uh, will get uh, one specific cookie value. And the same value if the action is an, is an IUCTL uh, will be for the FS IUCTL event. So now let's look at how it, it works in the kernel. So that was the API part, API, and now let's see uh, in the kernel. So Landlock is an LSM. So a Linux City module is mainly a framework which provides some way to hook in the kernel for access, access checks. That's why it's used by Linux, uh, Mac, and so on. But it's also used by uh, the main uh, access control mechanism, like uh, capabilities, Linux capabilities, uh, the integrity framework, and so on. The second part of Landlock is the EDPF part. So EDPF stands for Extended Backlit Packet Filter. So it's kind of an extension of the classic uh, VPF but it has more features. So basically it's an internal bike by machine, which is designed to be optimized, to be easily jitable. So to create a JIT code, if you want to, it's an option. And this is by code. So resulting from uh, your um, source uh, file, uh, you can do a magic operation, some comparison, you can jump, and call some function. However, there is some restriction. For example, you only can you can only jump forward. You cannot uh, jump uh, backwards, which make uh, any DPF uh, program not Turing complete. The idea here, the goal for this limitation, is to protect against uh, denial of service. Uh, with DPF, eBPF, you can also access uh, some parts of the memory, which is really limited. It's a wide list of the memory in a read or, or write way, depending on the DPF program type. And an important, interesting point here is you have the ability to exchange data to um, kind of an IPC, which is designed uh, for eBPF, to communicate with a user process through this map. So you can send commands and receive information, which is highly used, for example, for uh, debugging and tracing your system. So these are the features for eBPF. But an important point here is the kernel, when you load a VPF program, does a static uh, verification on this bytecode, which allow um, the kernel to restrict which part of the memory the program can access. Um, it allows us to um, follow, to paint, and to type uh, the register uh, from the VPS machine to check if an argument, well, a part of the memory um, is allowed to be uh, read or not. And for example, this allows to restrict um, pointer leak. Um, even if a VPF program can get, well, can store a pointer value in a register, it may not be able to read or to leak the value of this register. So it may, it may be only able to pass this value to a VPF function not to do arithmetic operation or um, any uh, operation on it. Okay. So finally, eBPF is widely used in the kernel. Uh, it was mainly used for the network, but it's 
allow easily use uh, for debugging and tracing, um, well, profiling uh, processes. So, an important point of LandOps is also the ability to create an unprivileged access control. So, why here this uh, notion of privilege? Um, well, it's quite simple. If you want a subject to be able to enforce a, secu a security policy on another subject, which is, by, for example, the kernel enforcing a security policy on process, you need the kernel to have more privileges, privileges than the, the process. And most of the time, especially for some box um, managers, um, the only way is to gain root access and then be able to use features which are dedicated to the administrator and then create a secure environment to launch uh, process in this sandbox environment or container. So here, Lanox is kind of an alternative to this interface. Um, the idea is not to give privileges to process to allow this process to um, drop accesses. The idea is to allow any process to restrict themselves. So to only um, do it in a positive way. An important point here, um, because this feature may be um, um, usable by interested processes, well, you need to be able to um, restrict and to protect other processes from the process which are sandbox. For example, um, with what well, to protect them from uh, features like uh, feed rates. But because Unlock is modifying the kernel, um, there is some security implication, implication too. Um, so we need to take care of uh, the kernel and to protect it and its resources. And especially to take care of the attack, attack surface. So one point is already, well, many addressed by uh, the eBPS uh, uh, machine, uh, thanks to its static analysis. And another point is specific to Lanark, which is uh, only executed, well, the rules are only executed after every stack of the Linux access control allow this action, well, the requested action on uh, the requested object. So Lanark is called, well, is the last one, last part of the kernel to allow or deny an access to a kernel object, to a file, for example. And so thanks to the eBPF static analyzer uh, verifier, uh, well, the lambda pool cannot dust the kernel. And there's also an important point here, because um, the lambda features may be allowed to for uh, unprivileged processes, um, we need to take care of uh, side channels, which may be um, introduced there. Uh, we, we don't want the rule from an interested process to be able to have more features uh, available um, than the originating process. So, now we can see like, uh, a demo. Um, it's not the code, the last code I sent on the main list, um, but it's, okay. it's um, uh, a new version, which is more advanced, but will not be released uh, soon, but it's kind of teaser. So here, so I think you can see my screen. Um, it's a simple script. 
uh, which I called uh, longitude Tuna. So Tuna is a, um, a spy browser. And I created a um, sandbox, a little sandbox manager uh, called uh, number two. Okay. And this sandbox manager is configured by two environment variables, LLPath RO and LLPath RW. So the thing is, this variable sets which paths are allowed to be read but not write. So you can access the home and some common directories. And for the write parts, uh, you can access only uh, a file in the home. The TMP directory and some other um, resources which you may want to be able to use. And then I launched uh, the file browser here with the icon. So it gives something like this. So first, well, let's first launch uh, China here. So I have access to what well, it's not using. I can go to my roots. So if I'm not to now here, I have access to everything and I can create uh, uh, folders. And if I launch the same application in um, a Lundbox sandbox, well, I can see the same files, except I cannot uh, change them and I cannot create new one. However, like say the policy, I can access the video folder here and create a uh, new thing there. And so I can go to the brand directory and because only the home user directory was allowed, I cannot go to the brand directory, which is home. I can go through, but not read the content. And I save the, the, the policy. I can also go to the TMP directory and create files if I want to. Right. So to wrap up with, uh, Landlock is a mechanism to have a user uh, to help developer or user to um, thanks to the uh, applications to have a fine grain access control. You can do uh, dynamic, uh, you can apply kind of dynamic security, and it is designed uh, to be used by infledge processes. But of course, you can use it uh, for uh, pre edge processes uh, also. Uh, currently, the six versions. Uh, was sent uh, some months ago. Um, and from now I have sent and merged some parts, uh, some patches which were part of the last uh, patch series. Um, EBPF, some EBPF LSM and, uh, uh, and test uh, modification. Um, you can follow the Next uh, patches uh, on the Linux kernel main list, the kernel admin mailing list, uh, the Linux security module, and the network mailing list. And so the last series is backport in uh, Linux kit. So you may want to test it, but the, definitely the next series will be more on testing. And last point, the roadmap. So the idea is to um, do an incremental stream integration. And the first step, the most important one, is to create and to have a minimum viable product. So this means to have the minimum code, which is testable and may be used in some way, but may not be, well, very interesting at first, but interesting to um, have the first step. The second step 
uh, will be to Amber C group. So either for the current process, thanks to the tech comp syscall, or thanks to the tech group, C group mechanism. The third step is to create um, a dedicated EBBS map uh, to check file system uh, object, which was uh, what I demo here, but uh, simpler, one, simpler one. And the fourth step here is to um, create, well, to enable uh, the entrelatch mode to, well, if, when the, all the thing will be tested, um, we could then enable this mode. So that's it. Um, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer your question. Thanks. Thanks, Mikhail. If anyone has any questions. Hi, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask uh, the rule that you showed for the demo is clearly much more complicated than the one you showed in the slide where you were just getting the mode for the file. How 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 does it work? Could you show the rule? How how do you pass uh, the list of files and directories that your uh, file manager could just open in uh, uh, read-only mode and write mode? How like what are the mechanics in terms of code? Do you have new new BPF helper that you can use when you write the rule yourself, or how does it work? If I may ask. I think you dropped. <laughs> I think uh, Mikhail, you're <laughs> muted if you're talking. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't drop. Yeah, there he is. I can unmute, him. I can unmute you if you'd like. Try that. Okay. Oh, is it working, Mikhail? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm there. Yes, yeah, so we didn't catch up. We were, uh, we had an answer. We didn't. We didn't unfortunately hear it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I left. Uh, it was a mistake. Oh. But um, can, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, sorry. The, the question I had was uh, uh, the, the demo that you just showed where you had uh, your, essentially your file manager sandboxed uh, mm -hmm. seems like a much more complicated rule than the one that you showed in the slide where you were just getting the uh, file mode with the BPF helper and, uh, you know, to just allow pipe. So I was wondering how are the mechanics of such a rule implemented? Like how such a rule looks like a rule where you pass the list of files that your, your process is supposed to be uh, opening. So I was just wondering if we could take a look at the rule that you actually used. Uh, yeah, um, but well, of course, the rule is more complex, but the thing is, it's uh, not um, like a production ready rule. So I can show it, but it's really um, like a quick and dirty way to do a demo, um, which is kind of, um, um, well, to say something. Um, but yes, I can show you the code. Um, Okay, so okay. Yes, one of the things that I think some of us are going to be curious about is this is more complicated than SE Linux policy. <laughs> so you mean is it more complicated? I'm betting it isn't, but I'll let you demonstrate ah, that. Okay. So but so I want to highlight that this rule is not um, um, isn't ready. It's just for the demo. Uh, so let's share a screen. Um, uh. Okay, so I guess you can see something here. Okay, so, um, so yeah, it's 
a bit more complicated. So first, well, maybe let, let me show you um, the user user part. Not sharing your screen. Ah, I'm not. Okay. Okay. Let's this way. One moment. Okay, so here is the, the user on part, which is kind of uh, normal. Um, so I'm gonna try to explain um, to see the big picture. So here there are two functions with gate, uh, which uh, get the um, uh, configuration from the environment variable. Um, and then create a map uh, with the path referring in this environment variable. And then I apply the sandbox uh, to um, the current process, we'll see that later, and then I exec the argument. So when I apply the command, well, it's kind of simple, um, I draw my releases, and I then call the sec comp um, syscall with an append common and uh, the eBPF program here. So this program is so this is the rule, the BPF rule. Well, let's see from the top. So I have two two maps here. Uh, a one which is dedicated for read only access uh, and another which is dedicated for read read write. And then the main function. So I get the context here. I get the mode. If there is an error, then I allow the thing. But this should not happen here. Um, here I have a check uh, to check if it is kind of a special file. Uh, for example, this, this could be uh, an even FD file. In which case, I allow this for now. It is simpler, uh, but of course the idea is to have a whitelist approach, not a blacklist one. And here, well, you can see the with me because it's kind of complex uh, for this uh, application. Um, well, the thing is, I'm going to show you kind of more um, advanced, uh, well, a more clean rule. Um, if uh, just give me um, okay give me 20 seconds and I'm gonna show show you uh, this uh, okay. so um Okay, I can try this one. Okay. Just checking if it's work. Okay. Um, 
Okay, I don't. Well, it's not really. I can show you the current one, but it's not. Okay, anyway. Um, well, I can show you what. I can show you something more interesting. I can. Okay. So here, so it's more like Titan. The idea here is to check to check for um, um, sockets. So I want to allow any access to sockets, um, which may be needed, for example, for this or something like that. And then here I just check uh, the access. Uh, well, if the action is kind of uh, right access, so this. Uh, is what right then you uh, remove another action and then I have kind of a loop here but it's a trick thanks to this one because I kind of create loop in DPF so it's a trick to tell uh, Clang to unwrap my loop and so well it's kind of um, well it's not uh, perfect here but anyway um, so the ma magic thing here is this function. So I pass the file hand uh, handle here and the map here, and then the i well uh, the index in the map. So this, this to get if the current um, file which is um, uh, acts well for which the process wants to access to um, is beneath a children or not in part of the, the IRT. So I do comparison here between the current file and uh, an entry in the map. And then according to this, um, well, if it's the same file, uh, I allow um, uh, I allow the, the, the access. Um, so if it's the same, if it's in the, if it is a directory and the action is an execution, I need, I must allow this access because it is needed to uh, go through a file hierarchy. For example, um, my slash home slash user, I need to be able to execute the slash home directory. And then if uh, the file is part of uh, is the children of the IACI, then I quit and allow the access here. Otherwise, the access is denied. Um, there's other part here, but not very really interesting. It's just to define which event I want to uh, to register to, to restrict, and the version of the ABI which is used. So it's a bit quick, but uh, yeah, I didn't intend to show this. Cool. That's. That's helpful. One, one, one last thing that I have is, do you envision that in the future you might have, uh, instead of having that BPF, uh, FS get hierarchy, something uh, um, more advanced, for example, something that supports uh, um, things that you have, for example, in a PARM or such as path compression, or instead having a very, very long list of files and having the LSM module build some sort of automaton that you can use to evaluate quickly, you know, hundreds of files or things like that. Yeah. yeah, of course. That's why I didn't really want it to show this because <laughs> this, this the, clearly does not scale. Okay. And of course we, we want something 
uh, what I want something to to be able to scale and to handle a lot of files. Uh, cool. Cool. So the idea is to create a dedicated map, which is uh, not the map I use here, and kind of a, a set of file handles. Well, um, kind of a view of the file system, which includes uh, some file archives um, with mount points and things like that. So, well, it should be much more scalable and easier to use. Cool, yeah. Yeah, but thank you for showing this. It's, it's uh, I mean, even if uh, it's not uh, as scalable as it might eventually be, it, it, gives you a, it gives you clearly a nice idea of how the mechanics between uh, uh, how, how, how a rule should move in order to implement the logic. Thanks. Can, um, one of your other steps was uh, C groups. Um, can you talk a little bit about the motivation for that? It seems to me like a weird mix of APIs, but. Um... So the C group part was, well, it was part of a previous series, previous part series, but I remove it because it wasn't the needed a minimum viable product. But um, I think the, the second step should be quite, um, more well, quick um, because I think uh, I what well, we already discussed about the design and I think it should be um, it should not be a big issue um, right I guess I'm wondering what the motivation from user space like what's the so like I, right now you have a policy that's being installed sort of set comp style yeah um, but the motivation is mainly for container stuff to be able to um, tight a C group. Uh, well, to C group is to list a group of, of processes. So you may want to, you already, already have this um, um, process identification, which is which may be performed by your container, uh, by systemd or whatever. And you may want to apply um, an access control on this uh, group of process. So it's an alternative way. Uh, it may be more interesting for um, the administrator of the machine, but it may be used as well. Well, we need to discuss, discuss about that, but an idea is to, um, it, sh it should be usable by um, unprivileged user the same way if they're able to change the C group thanks to the C group delegation. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Miguel, for the, the deep dive and showing us the demo and code. That was, that was awesome. So if you have any questions, um, do not hesitate to send me an email or um, respond to the mailing list. Um, write a comment or um, a review or whatever. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I should take a look. At yeah, maybe. Uh, you can, we can sync <coughs> offline, but I guess you have, yeah, you have the patch series and mailing list here. I can include the links to the mailing list and your handle in the meeting yeah. so that folks know where to go. Yeah, of course. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it was a great meeting today. We'll have our next meeting in two weeks on July 5th. I'll post an agenda soon as we figure out uh, and give what we want to talk about. If you have any proposals, please feel free to just contact me directly or comment uh, in the repo uh, or on the community Slack. But yep, thanks for everyone for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.